All right, God, well, here we are again. Coming before your throne here, Lord, with open ears and eager hearts. We believe your word when it says that is by hearing the word of God where we get faith. Jesus' disciples wanted more faith. Jesus' Jesus' disciples should want more faith. Faith to believe. Faith to trust. Faith to fight. And so, Lord, we're coming before you tonight, and we're asking you for faith. We're asking you to speak to us, Lord, so we might hear your voice. We're coming ready to receive, Lord. We came to this place to supernaturally hear from a supernatural God, the one true God, the creator of heaven and earth. That's who we need to hear from tonight. And so we're calling out the name of Jesus, and we're asking you to speak to us tonight, Lord. We want to hear from you. As your eyes go back and forth across the earth right now, we would only plead that your eyes would pause here and see us and see that we are gathered in your house to praise your name, to sing your praises, to listen to your word, to follow your spirit. That's what we want here. Can you hear us? We're knocking, we're seeking, we're asking, and we're welcoming you. Dwell amongst us here tonight and do an incredible work in us. In Jesus' name. All right, loved ones, this is kind of a, uh, it's kind of a weird week, you know? I don't know if you know this. This, uh, this, this week between Christmas and New Year's, you know? And uh, I didn't know this, really, but this is the week that pastors usually take their week off because, and it's understandable because they the pastor and, and his team will pour themselves into Christmas. It's the, you know, it's the end of the year. We want to finish up with a big bang. And so we put together these big nights and big days and big productions. And it's a big to-do. And we a lot of planning and a lot of praying and a lot of preparation. And it is a lot of work. And pastors are just saying, man, Tuesday's coming. Tuesday's coming because that's when Christmas is over. And so they get to rest, and then most of the time they take the week off. And this is the week between the end of the year, the culmination, the big pinnacle of the, of the year, Christmas, and then, of course, New Year's, and, and everyone's excited about the new ministry year and what God's going to do in their life and in their church. And so there's big plans for that, too. That's the week that the, most pastors get up before their people, and, you know, they cast vision for the next year and tell them what's going to happen in the next year. But in between that is this week. It's the filler week. It's the week when the youth intern who's never preached in his life gets to get up and preach. It's, it's the week when the worship leader gets to preach. It's, it's the week that most churches, I have to tell you this, if you've been in ministry at all, you know this, it's the week where they just try to get through it, man. They just try to get through it. But I learned something. Um, from our friends at Harvest Bible Chapel, the Vertical Church people, I learned something from their, pa from their worship pastor, Andy Rozier, and he said, heaven forbid we don't bring God our best every single week. There's 52 weeks in the year, not 51. There's 52 weeks, and we need to bring our very best to Jesus every single time that we gather. And I took that to heart, and so, I don't know, I studied my tail off this week, and I... I'm ready to give, I'm ready to leave it all out on the field, man. I'm ready to leave it out on the field, but I'm asking you the same thing. 
Are you ready to leave it out on the field? Are you ready to engage it with me and with the Lord and his word and engage in this sermon and be a part of it and to be alive, right? Ready to receive. Are you ready to receive? Are you, do you believe? Let me ask you a question. Do you believe that when God's word is proclaimed to you to change you, that you'll be different today because you heard it? Do you? You do? Do you? Do you? Yeah. How about that young lady right there, right next to you? Do you? How about that dude right behind you? Barbara, do you believe you're going to be changed when you hear God's word proclaimed? Awesome. Does everybody believe that? You have to be coming, panting with anticipation, right? That's the way you're supposed to be. So I want to, I don't want to, I'm not down with a filler week, okay? I'm not down with that in any way. I want to bring the best that we can. And I want to I want to leave here different, including me, just because I'm speaking. I want to be different because I was here. And so let's uh, let's get at this thing. And I want to read to you a section of scripture. And I I actually preached through the, the book of Joshua three years ago in this church. And I don't know if anyone was here for that, but um, I mentioned what I'm going to read about what I'm going to preach about tonight. I, I, I like, I, 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 I rubbed up against it, <laughs> but I didn't go in detail, but it deserves a full message. It's really awesome. And so I want to share this with you. So would you do me a favor and would you turn to uh, the book of Joshua? It's the fifth book of the Bible. It's way, way back, all the way left. And um, Joshua is the guy who was appointed by God to take over the leadership position of the people of Israel uh, after Moses. When Moses died, then God put Joshua in charge. And so what has happened now is that, just context as you're turning there, Moses has led them right to that, that place. They're right here on the edge. They're ready to cross over and, and take uh, control of the land and to, to grab hold of the promise that God had given them uh, forever ago. And so Moses has died, Joshua's in, they're getting ready to go and do their thing and move into the land and take over, and this is the promise of God, and here they are, Joshua chapter 1, and I just want to read, um, let me just read just a little context, and I'm going to, um, I, I don't know what's on the screen, uh, 13 through 15, but I'm going to, I'm going to go back, I'm going to start in verse 10, just read this to you, okay? Um, Joshua then commanded the officers of Israel, go through the camp, and tell the people to get their provisions ready. Get the people ready. Get ready. Because in three days you're going to cross the Jordan River and take possession of the land the Lord your God is giving you. Hundreds of years they've been waiting for this moment. And Joshua's like, it's going down right now. Are you guys excited about that? And so, so he's like, get ready because in, in just three days this is going to happen. Then Joshua calls together uh, the tribes of Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh. So not everybody, but some of them. And he says... Remember when Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you. The Lord your God is giving you a place of rest. This is the promised land. This is where they were going to be able to actually live the way God had promised them that they would live someday. This place of rest. He has given you this land. Your wives, children... This is where we're supposed to be now. He has given you this land. Your wives, children, and livestock may remain here in the land Moses assigned to you on the east side of the Jordan River... But your strong warriors, fully armed, must lead the other tribes across the Jordan to help them conquer their territory. Stay with them until the Lord gives them rest as he has given you rest. And until they too possess the land the Lord your God is giving them. Only then may you return and settle here on the east side of the Jordan River in the land that Moses, the servant of the Lord, assigned you. So, I just wanted to point this out to you in case you didn't know. And like today, Israel, the border is the Jordan River. But back in these days, it was not. Israel extended way past the Jordan River. So, there were some that were going to get land on this side of the river, and some that were going to get land on that side of the river. And so, that's what's happening right here. Okay? So, I want to talk to you tonight, but kind of hinted to it. Uh, on Facebook this week, and you probably could feel the hint in the music that we sang. I want to talk to you tonight about warriors, okay? I want to talk to you about warriors, and I don't know if there's any warriors in the room here with me, but I hope that tonight there'll be some warriors leaving this place, okay? 
Um, so here's the definition of a warrior, just so you know. Hey, I wonder if I'm a warrior, okay? A warrior is this, is a brave or experienced soldier or fighter. That's what a warrior is, okay? Now listen, brave doesn't mean that you're never afraid, okay? Brave doesn't mean that you're never afraid or beat up or beat down. It means that I keep moving forward even though I am afraid. Even though I am getting whooped real bad, I keep moving forward, okay? There's a big difference between fear and brave, okay? Fear paralyzes you, and bravery mobilizes you. You understand? doesn't mean that you're not afraid, but you move anyway because you're brave. Now, why would I move forward because I'm, why would I move forward? I'm afraid. Why would I move forward? Well, it's not in, on, on any screen here, but I want to take you back for a second to our, our boy Gideon. There's a guy, Gideon, in the Bible. He's, he's a wimp, okay? He's a wimp. He's never done anything heroic. He's never, he's not a tough guy. He's not covered in ink. He's not flexing his biceps. He's never been in a fight. Nothing. He's a wimp. And God comes to him one day when this, these people, the Midianites, are oppressing Israel. And instead of going to Israel's toughest guy who had been in combat, he goes to Israel's wimpiest guy and says, Mighty warrior, you're going to lead. Mighty warrior, some translations say, Mighty man of valor. Mighty hero, the Lord is with you. The Lord is with you. See, see, he wasn't, he hadn't done anything to be called a mighty warrior. God's calling on his life made him a mighty warrior. God knew something that was inside of this man that that man didn't know existed. And God was calling it out of him and saying, mighty warrior, you're going to lead the fight. And I don't know, maybe tonight there's some people in this room right now that don't feel very tough. But maybe you'll hear God calling you a mighty warrior before you leave. And maybe you're the next Gideon. Maybe you're the next person who's going to stand up and fight for the Lord and advance his kingdom across the earth. Maybe you're getting called out tonight. I don't know. I hope so. I hope you leave fired up. See, strong warriors, they steer down fear. And they fight forward. And they take back territory from darkness by injecting the light of the gospel into people and into situations so that the kingdom of Jesus expands and people's lives are changed for the better. That's what a warrior does. You know, are you a warrior? Maybe you're a warrior instead of a warrior. Here, let's, um, I found three things in our text right here in Joshua. I'd like to share them with you, what a warrior is. I don't want to make anything up. You're going to find it in the scriptures. First and foremost, you see that a warrior, you saw it there, right? Strong warriors. You guys alive out there? Okay, just checking. They're fully armed. You see that there in the text? Do you? They're leaders. You see that, right? And then the third one, I kind of struggled with what they call the third one. I was like, Others oriented, but that's not warrior language, right? That's not tough. Then I thought, well, mission minded, that's still not tough. On mission, that's what they are. You know, listen, I don't know what you were doing today. I don't know what you're doing right now, but real warriors are on mission right now. They came, if you're sitting in this room tonight, some of you are warriors in here because you came to worship Jesus and you came because you're expecting him to speak into you so you can have greater faith, so you can go out and fight more. That's why you came. Some of you are just sitting here. I don't know which one you are. But warriors are always on mission. While you're sitting at home snoozing, they're thinking about ways to fight forward. That's what they're doing. They're, they're obsessed with the kingdom of God. They don't stand down. They don't stop. They're always fighting. That's what warriors do. Now, they're on mission. So you look at the text here. Let's just look at what's going on here. There was a place of rest. His warriors are to help people find the place of rest. You saw that in the text, right? There's a place, Israel, and that was the place where they could um, 
flourish as a people, not be oppressed by Egypt. They could farm and reap a harvest. They could worship freely. They could live the way God had promised that they could live. And it was going to take place in that place. Now, I'm going to say something, and the Bible will support it, and you'll see it. Because, you know, you don't say something and go looking in the Bible to try to support it. You look at the Bible and see what it says, and that's what you preach, right? So when I say that the place of rest is still available, you should be saying, chapter and verse, preacher, right? Chapter and verse, is that what you want to hear? The place of rest is still available. But it's not a place, it's a person. It's a person. Go all the way to the back of the Bible to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 4. Please go there. Hebrews chapter 4. Look at the first three verses there. Tell me when you're there. All right. All right, warriors, this is what it says. God's promise of entering his rest still stands. Okay, so you see it there, right? I didn't make anything up. It still stands. So we ought to tremble with fear that some of you might fail to experience it. For this good news, that's good, the good news. What's the good news? That God has prepared this rest. Has been announced to us, like us right here as we're reading it, so we know now, just as it was to them. Who's, he, who's them? Who's them? Who's them? Right there, back to Joshua, right? It was announced to them. They could go and have rest. And now he's announcing it to us. But it did them no good because they didn't share the faith of those who listened to God. For only we who believe can enter his rest. So there's some things there that you need to notice. One, uh, it's still available. That was, the, that, was the, that was what I said. That was my claim, right? You see it there in the text. It's still available. And then it says... We ought to fear. We, just, we ought to tremble with fear that some of you might fail to experience it. That's the motivation to fight as a warrior. It should bother you that people around you that you know and you say you love don't know about the rest that is found in Christ. It should make you tremble with fear that they might not experience it. That's your motivation. And then how do you get it? For only we who believe can enter his rest. Does it matter if you're Jewish? Does it matter if you're born in Jerusalem? No. You have to believe. You have to believe. What do we have to believe? Well, you made a hint to it a moment ago. I mentioned it. Did you see it there? The good news. You've got to believe something. What do we got to believe? Look in Matthew chapter 11. Jesus is about to tell you what you need to believe. Talking about rest here. Finding rest with the Lord. Finding rest for your soul, right? Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 and 29. Jesus said, Come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Does it matter if they live in Tulsa? Does it matter if they live in Anchorage? Does it matter if they live in Russia? It doesn't make any difference. Anyone who comes to me and I will give you rest, you don't need to go to Jerusalem anymore. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you. Because I am humble and gentle at heart. And you will find rest for your soul. Jesus Christ is the good news. Jesus Christ is the rest for your soul. Listen. Loved ones, we have been called into a mission, and I want to win. I want to win, because when I win, and you win, then Jesus wins. And when King Jesus wins, his kingdom advances. Right? So we need to fight to win. We need to fight to win. I like this guy. <clears throat> When Jesus commissions us to go make disciples and dunk them and teach them, he's telling his warriors to go out and take ground one person at a time. 
That's what he's telling us to do. It's not some simple, lucky, happy Sunday school Jesus on the wall where he's gathering up kids. It's a fight. It's a fight. There's, it's a spiritual war out there. And, 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 and we're in the middle of it. And I, wanna, I want to win. I don't know about you guys, but I, I want to win. Jesus wants to win. And listen, he's going to win. The question is, is are you going to be a part of that win? He is going to win. He is going to grow his church. There will be churches across this world that will explode with new salvation and repentance and revival. And the question is, is do you want it to be your church or someone else's? He's going to build his church. He's going to win. And I want to be a part of that. That's why he called. Listen, I was like Gideon. I was nothing. But he called me. He called me into the fight. And that's why after all these years, I'm still a raging lunatic. Because I'm, I, I want to win. I want to win. Not, and listen, I, I love my son. But and whatever happens when he's preaching somewhere, God bless his little heart. I'm talking about it in the land of the living right now in my life. Some of us are, are closer to the end than we are to, to the beginning, and I want to see it in my lifetime, right? I want to see revival break out. I want to see a church that's exploding with people who love Jesus, serve Jesus, worship Jesus like crazy. That's what I want to see. That's what we're up against. We're, we're in a fight all the time for this thing. <coughs> Listen, I love Paul. I don't know who your favorite person in the Bible is. I, lo I love... Yes, I love Jesus the most. Don't judge. Okay, I love Paul. He's a warrior, man. The guy was a crazy warrior. Look what he says in 2 Timothy chapter 2. He says this to his young protege, Timothy, who's training up to be a warrior, right? He's training up this dude to be this pastor. And he says this. He says, endure suffering along with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. Endure suffering. Opening up a can here tonight. We're going to get into that suffering thing. Endure suffering. It's not going to be easy. It's going to be painful. It's going to hurt. Sacrificial. Hard. Long. Gritty. Awful. Endure suffering along with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. I'm not going to rewrite scripture, but a good soldier, a strong warrior, right? Do you see it? I'm not making anything up. But I mean, isn't it pretty much the same thing here what he's talking about? Tough guy. Let's get at this thing, right? He says, soldiers don't get tied up in the affairs of civilian life. For if they do, <coughs> they cannot please the officer who enlisted them. Let me just ask you a question. And you all know the answer. It's a loaded question. It's super easy. Who commissioned you into this fight? Jesus? Okay. Listen, so if you believe that, then you believe what it says. If you get caught up in the affairs other than building his kingdom, you cannot please him. How many of us want to hear, well done, my good and faithful servant? Right? You want to hear that. You know, it says that without faith, it's impossible to please God. So you're all like, oh, i got to have faith, i got to have faith. Here's another one. And I'm the preacher who tells you what the rules are. No one wants to talk about it in church. Everyone wants to talk about grace, and I love grace. If it wasn't for grace, we wouldn't be saved. I get it. But listen, if you want to please God, you can't get caught up in other stuff that's not kingdom building. And it says it. I didn't make it up, did I? Y'all read it out of your Bible? Is it say anything different than the King James? Same thing, right? Same thing. If you get caught up, listen, if you're in the military, how many people have ever served in the military? One, two, three. Okay, so you understand that when you're over in your little marine world, right? When you're over in your little navy world, right, what we're doing out here is a totally different world. You have your own language, you have your own goals, you have your own schedule, you all talk in code, 
Blair was just home the other day. T P P T T P C P four P. What are you even talking about, dude? Uh, right? right. But that's what they're doing, right? right? You don't know. You don't care what's going on over here stateside, whatever uh, off the base. You got your own little world over there, and if you don't pay attention to your little world, people die. Right? So you're fully engaged, and if you're not thinking about what they're wanting you to think about, you're in trouble. And and the word of God is saying, listen. A good soldier of Christ, the one who's the warriors, they're engaged in building my kingdom. That's what they're thinking about all the time. They're not getting caught up in the affairs of what the other folks are doing. You can fill that list up with whatever you want, but I guarantee you, if it's not about building the kingdom, it'll fit right on that list perfectly. All of our little hobbies and habits and things that we do all the time. He said, don't get, don't tire in your mission. Don't quit. Don't bail out. Stand your ground. Don't get distracted by all this other stuff that you want to do. It's difficult in America. We got so much to do. How many people right now are honestly thinking about another football game that's being played right now? Busted. And Jesus, who commissioned you into his army, said, stop getting caught up in all that junk. It doesn't do anything for you. Endure. Endure. That's what a soldier does. That's what a warrior does. He endures. He's, he's living for other people. He's on mission all the time. And it's always hard. But a warrior stands their ground and fights. And we're all supposed to have the same attitude that Christ had. You know, serving other people and going after them and it's not easy because we're in a world that says serve yourself and take care of yourself and take care of me first and then then if you have a little extra you can maybe help out someone else and that's not what Jesus ever taught um, you're in the New Testament do me a favor and look I don't like jumping all over the place but look over in Philippians chapter 2 I just want to read a little section here we're talking about Enduring as a good soldier, right? Enduring, that means staying in the fight. Always paying attention to the mission. Always fighting forward, even when it's hard. Even when it's long. Even when it's dirty. <coughs> Can't always put other people first. What about me? Um, how about this? Chapter 2 of Philippians. So some questions, and maybe you guys could just shout out your answer when you, when you hear it. Is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? That was your shout? Yeah. Holy moly. What happened to you people? Huh? Okay. Is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? Yeah. yeah. I mean, is anybody fired up in here about being a Christian? <laughs> right? You're fired up about it. Jeez. <laughs> Any comfort from his love? Yeah. yeah. Any fellowship together in the spirit? Yeah. Are your hearts tender and compassionate? Well, you might not yell there. Maybe getting better, right? He says this. Okay, so if, if you're answering yes to these things, like if, 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 if becoming a Christian has benefited you in any way, then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another, and working together. Like if you have become a Christian, then you're supposed to be, you're called to work. You're called to do something, right? In response to what he's done for you, you're called to work, not just work, but work together with one mind and purpose, right? Don't be selfish, he says. If you have benefited from this in any way, don't be selfish. Don't you think other people would want that too? And how will they know unless they're told? How will they know unless they're told? Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of, see, we're supposed to, watch this. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. Watch this. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. That's his attitude. His attitude is you were more important than him. 
He was willing to sacrifice and go through hell because of you. And we're supposed to have the same attitude. This is not, this is everybody, guys. This isn't just the strong warriors who are charging the gates of hell. I'm talking about every single Christian, it says, should have the same attitude as Christ, considering, considering others more important than themselves. And that's the glue that keeps you in the game. That's what makes serving people every single day to advance the kingdom of God. That's how you stay in the game. Having the same attitude that Christ had. That's what he wants for you. And that's, so it's hard to continue day after day, week after week, year after year, pouring yourself back into the ministry of reconciliation to advance the kingdom of God. It's difficult unless you have the same attitude that Christ had and you see the value in the people that are not in these seats right now. If they're important to you, you will never tire of fighting forward to get them here. And notice, your interests are tied into other people's interests. You saw it there in the text. We just read it in Philippians, right? It's like, don't just look out only for your own, but take an interest in others as well. So it's not like just them or just you. It's both, right? It's both. And that's why we go back to Joshua. It's the same kind of a thing. He's like, if you want rest, you have to help other people rest. If you, and we all want to have peace with God. We all want to prosper. We all want to be successful. We all want to flourish as human beings, right? And God's like, listen, the only way you can get that is if you help others get that as well. It's part of the deal. My interests are only served when I help others enter into relationship with the Lord as well. Listen, it's part of your salvation, and, and you can't have fulfillment in your salvation experience until you help other people to do the same. <clears throat> John, in 1 John, he said that as he's opening up his book. 1 John, you can read it sometime. He starts saying, I, this is the Jesus that we saw. This is the Jesus we, we listened to. We saw him do this. We, we were with him. And I'm telling you about the, this Jesus. He's telling to these people. He says, so that our joy may be complete. Do you see that? He's not telling them this so that their joy can be complete necessarily. Although it is. If you get saved, that's good. But he's realizing, I can't have total fulfillment. I can't have all that God would want for me in my salvation relationship with you unless I help you to have the same. It's part of our salvation experience. <coughs> we have to help others conquer evil. We have to help others conquer sin. We have to help them by connecting them with Jesus. People need rest for their soul. All of us do. Only then, only then it says, may you settle down and go, okay God. Only then, when ev listen, when everyone around you knows Jesus, that's when you get to retire. So this whole idea of American retirement, man, as we get older, some of us are closer to our end than our beginning. We shouldn't be slowing down, Jay, right? Just speeding up. I want to do more for the Lord in my last days than I ever did in my beginning. I want more. More for Jesus. One more for Jesus before I die. That's what we should be doing all the time. <clears throat> Basically, what I'm telling you is that you never get to retire. You know, my, my wife and I, this is seriously no boasting in any way, because sometimes what I'm about to tell you is awful and I don't like it. <clears throat> but we have this little saying around our house, our life is not our own. It's not. If someone in this church calls at any time, any day, off I go, off she goes. I need a babysitter. I need you to help me with this. I need you to help me with that. Can you come talk to me? Can I come see you? Can you help me do this? I can't come in. Can you fill in for me? It's just doom, boom, bum, 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 bum. Our life is not our own. And as a Christ follower, that's the way it's supposed to be. 
Your life is not your own. You've been purchased at a price, a very high price, the blood of Jesus Christ. You're not your own anymore. And so you've been purchased, and now you're to be used as a tool in his toolbox to reconcile the lost world to himself. You're not your own. But I have other things I want to do. I have other I have other interests, and I have other pleasures and hobbies, and why is it always got to be about Jesus? Because it is. I don't have any high theology there for you. Because it is. Endure. Endure. That's what warriors do. They endure when it's hard. They endure when it's difficult, and it's, and it's time-consuming, and sacrificial, and it hurts, and nobody notices, and nobody cares, and they rip you a new one, and you don't get much in return for it, and you just want to quit, and you want to put your feet up, you can't. You endure. You don't get caught up in other stuff. You endure. You endure. <clears throat> Here's another one, too. This is, I love, like I said, I think it was last week, you don't base your church on one little section of Scripture, right? You find something that goes running all the way through. That you can really bank on. Okay? You can build on that. So I read you out of, out of Joshua, Philippians, um, 1 John, how about Jeremiah 29, right? Jeremiah 29 is that famous section of scripture, verse 11, you know, the pl- I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Most of us have heard that one if we don't already have it memorized, but Jeremiah 29, 7 says this about people, his people. He says this to his people. God says, work for the peace and prosperity of the city where I sent you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, for its welfare, like how it's doing, its health, its prosperity, its peace, its joy. Its welfare will determine your welfare. (laughs) How many people, when they were growing up as a kid, like I'm talking like 10, 12 years old, had in their dream to live in Leesburg, Tavares, Grand Island, Fruitland Park, Eustis, Mount Dora. Umatilla. How many people, man, that's, Mom, when I grow up, I want to live in Umatilla. (laughs) Ask the Tula. Mm. Yeah. Howie. Like, did anyone ever dream, man, this is where I want to be. So, I'm just, so this, this, this verse should speak to you a little bit. Like, maybe there was something else going on here. Right? Well, I mean, why are you here? It wasn't what you want it to be. So why is it in a room of fairly intelligent, right? We're not like Harvard grads, but fairly intelligent people. Fairly uh, educated. Fairly, um, I don't know, mechanically inclined. I mean, just, we're just people who can get stuff done. Like, we're not just total morons sitting in this room, are we? We're, all, we're regular Joes, but we can get stuff done, right? So why in a room of this many people that are, you know, above average folks, why aren't you where you wanted to be? <laughs> Maybe there's something going on here. Ooh, what was that? Ah. So maybe there's something going on here. Maybe there's something divine going on here. Maybe he sent you into exile to Umatilla. I'm just saying, right? I mean, I don't think any of us are like considering that, that where we live is exile, like Siberia or something. But nobody really planned on being in Leesburg when they were a kid. Okay, but here you are. So since he sent you here, what are you supposed to do? Work for the peace and prosperity of the city. And pray for it. Listen, for its welfare will determine your welfare. So personally, you, you aren't doing well, even if you've said yes to Jesus and you're glory bound, that's awesome, praise the, praise the Lord. But you aren't doing well if, you're, if the people in your circle of influence are not doing well. If they have not met Jesus yet and found the rest, the peace, the prosperity, 
the joy, the fulfillment, the purpose, and the eternity that's found in Christ, if they have not found that, you're not doing well. And see, we have have to change our perspective because we all think that if we start to do well, then I can help other people do well. And if we can get some people up in this church, then maybe we can influence this city if we have more people. Uh, Wrong. This... Let's try this. Karen, I'm hoping you had it on mute. Hello, 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 hello. Hello. Awesome. Sorry, Karen. I love you. Don't hurt me. She scares me. Um, She lassoes horses. Work for the peace and prosperity of the city. And we're, we're, we're called together as a people, right? We're here together. And so, revolu- like, if, 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 this, if we packed out five services, but yet there were, the majority of the people in, 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 in this city and in Grand Island and in Fruitland Park and Tavares and Eustace, if they still don't know Jesus, even if we're packed out, we're not successful. We're only successful if the city knows Jesus, not just everyone in our church. And and we're supposed to work for the peace and prosperity of the city. We're supposed to pray for the peace and prosperity of the city. Let me ask you a question. How many hours a week do you spend doing that? How many many dollars a week do you spend doing that? Not, Not many. Not nearly enough when you consider the mandate that God has given us that we're supposed to be investing into the people, into the advancement of the kingdom because it doesn't matter if you're making money and getting wealthy because if they're poor and they're struggling and you aren't, you're not doing well. You can have all the money in the world, but if there's people around you that are struggling because you won't let go of it, we're not doing well. You see it there in the text, right? I'm not making anything up. So Israel was getting ready to <clears throat> enter into a new season, and God made it perfectly clear to them that to fully enjoy that new season of their life, they had to help others to do the same. It's hard work, and it's long work, and it's messy, dirty work, and it's sacrificial work, but it's crawl into your house late at night, and just barely be able to get your feet up into the bed and lay down, and my body hurts so much work, but it's good work. That's good work. And that's the kind of work that he's called his people to. Not half-hearted effort, not show up when you want to when there's nothing else better to do. And all of us are entering into a new season of ministry opportunity, too. It's the flip of the calendar. It's 2019. And I'm excited about what happened here in 2018, culminating with our New Year's Eve event. I mean, our, uh, our Christmas Eve event. That was awesome. But listen, we can rejoice and be thankful, but don't look back anymore. I don't even want to talk about it anymore. I don't want to talk about Christmas Eve anymore. I want to talk about this week and next week. And all 52 weeks of this 2019 calendar. And what God can do right here in and through us here at Revolution Church. And 2019 is quickly rushing upon us. And the real people of God, his warriors, they know the mission. And they're seeking to fight and move the the kingdom of God forward. They're not looking for excuses. They're not looking for a hall pass. They're not looking for praise. They're not looking for easy. They're not looking for shortcuts. They're looking to pray and work tirelessly for the people that God has supernaturally placed us next to. So that they can find and experience all that you have in Christ. That's why we're here. Paul says, endure. Endure. I hear a lot of people 
talk about how tired they are. I'm tired. I'm burnt out. Paul says endure. He says endure. You know, he only uses this word twice. <clears throat> In all of the New Testament, this word endure is only used twice. It's the Greek word. If I don't pronounce it right, Dino, you let me know. Kakopaseo. Close enough? Sounds kind of like that. It means this. It means to undergo hardship. To be afflicted and then to endure affliction. To suffer trouble. It's, it's a voluntary entering into suffering and affliction. And it's a voluntary staying in the affliction. Do you understand? That's what enduring is. The warrior for Christ realizes that the battle for ministry is difficult and he willingly steps into the fray and says, bring it on and I don't care how battered and bloody and tired I am, I'm going forward with this thing. Because that's what God's called me to. And, and a little boo-boo isn't going to hurt anybody. Put a band-aid on it. <clears throat> Work and pray for the city. For its welfare will determine the welfare of Revolution Church. We're here as a church family to help those that live and work here in Leesburg, Tavares, Grand Island, Fruitland Park, Eustis, this area to connect with Jesus Christ. That's why we're here. So his kingdom grows and the people can find rest from this crazy world. You all said there was a benefit to becoming a Christian, right? You've experienced benefit. How many people that are not here tonight need that? How many? All of them. Early church leader Augustine said it this way, Thou hast made us for thyself, O Lord, and our heart is restless until it finds rest in thee. Kingdom work is difficult, isn't it? It is difficult. It's sacrificial. It's long hours. It's painful. Endure, 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 endure. Endure suffering as a good soldier of Christ. And oftentimes, it's not noticed or appreciated. You know, uh, Hebrews chapter 6, verse 10 says, For God is not unjust. He will not forget how hard you have worked for him. <clears throat> you know many, <laughs> do you know how many times people have come to this church or come to me personally and, and said they were suffering with addiction, whatever kind, drinking, drugs usually, drinking or drugs, drinking or drugs, and, and they come to you, and they're looking for help, and you tell them the truth, and they hate you. They get ticked off at you because you tell them the truth. And the truth is, whatever you choose to obey becomes your master. That little cigarette, that little crack, that little bottle has no power. It's, it's, a, it's liquid. It's a, it's a weed, right? It has no power. The only power it has is the power you give it. So choose differently. And they're like, no, 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 It's not that easy. It's not that easy. You don't know. You're not addicted. I do know. I was. And they hate you for it. <clears throat> well, I was just kind of going through a little bit of a season recently of lots of hate. But, you know, God is so good. And he sends his little messengers to you sometimes with just that encouraging word, right? So I was kind of feeling down in the dumps. And my, my sweet mama, Marty, she sent me a text it was about a week or so ago. It just said, 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Well, I just happened to know that one by heart, so I was blessed by it. But if you don't know it by heart, it just says, just remember that nothing you ever do for the Lord is in vain. People, <laughs> I'm telling you, ministry is hard. It's dirty. It's long hours. It's often unnoticed, but God notices it. And that's what he's called you to. That's what he's called us to. So listen, soldiers. A soldier, a warrior, 
is on mission all the time. Okay? All the time. Never stops. Doesn't, listen, there's no such thing as burnt out. Okay? You fight. And you don't stop until you're dead. That's what you do. Okay? That's what you do. You don't stop. Okay, now, so how does, the, how does the warrior fight? I mean, how do they, they want to fight to win, right? So what was, the, what was the next thing on the list? They were fully armed, right? What's a fully armed warrior for Christ look like? Well, I got, what, six things I jotted down. You can jot them down if you want to. Here's the first thing. Here's the first weapon, the great permission. And I didn't say it wrong. It's not the great commission. It's the great permission. How do you fight and win? How does the salesman get into the gated community? How is he going to win? He gets the gate code, right? He gets, the, he gets permission to go in. Jesus Christ said in Matthew 28, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Now go make disciples. That's your first weapon. You have permission from Jesus. Nobody can tell you not to do this thing. That's the first thing. The second thing it says, listen, you're supposed to work for the peace and prosperity of the, sir, of, of the city that you're in. So the second one is your spiritual gift. When you became a believer, it says in 1 Corinthians 12, 7, that a spiritual gift is given to each of us to help each other out. And, and when he's talking about these different gifts, he says there's different types of serving. You're supposed to serve. You're supposed to work for the people. Work diligently for the peace and prosperity of the city, not just yourself. <clears throat> it's very hard to preach that in these days that we live in. So it's the great permission, your spiritual gift. Here's the third one, prayer. Prayer. The, the Bible says that the prayers of a righteous man profit much, availeth much. Okay, When you pray and you ask God to enter into this fray with you, he does, and it actually causes something to happen. It brings back fruit. It brings back profit. We're supposed to pray. He says, pray to the Lord for the city, for its welfare. <clears throat> so we pray. Here's the fourth one. Us, the church, all of us together. We're the ecclesia. We're the called out ones. We're not part of the world anymore. We're part of his kingdom. We're part of his church. In Ecclesiastes, see Ecclesia, Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 9, two people are better off than one, for they can help each other succeed. If one person falls, the other can reach out and help. But someone who falls alone is in real trouble. Likewise, two people lying close together can keep each other warm. But how can one be warm alone? A person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two can stand back to back and conquer. Three are even better. For a triple braided cord is not easily broken. That's the church. That's us together. That's how we fight to win, when we do it together. Okay, we're not out there by ourselves. We stay close to the flock, as Pastor Jay mentioned in his sermon a couple weeks ago. What do, what do sheep do when there's danger? They get closer together in the flock. And they, what do they do? They probably put their butts to each other, right? So everybody's got to look. Nobody can get in, into the flock because everybody's watching. They get closer. And that's what we're supposed to do. Get your butts together, everybody. Here's the next one, the full armor of God. Right? I'm not going to go over the pieces, but we have truth, we have righteousness, we have peace, we have faith, we have seven. Listen, these first five things, these first pieces of armor are your protection. When the enemy comes, you have to fend for yourself so you can continue and fight on. You have the truth. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no one gets to the Father except through me. So you know you can fight to win because you know that what, you're, what you have and what you teach is true. Okay, that's a weapon. You have righteousness. The one who knew no sin became sin so that in him you would become the righteousness of God. So when the enemy comes and says, stand down because you did this, you go, it doesn't matter because Jesus' righteousness is mine. I can fight, and I don't have to listen to you because Jesus is, is in me. I'm good. So you can tell him to go to hell. You have peace. It says in the Bible that because of what Jesus did on the cross, that God has made peace with you if you said yes to it. So when the devil comes and tells you to stand down, you can say, no, 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 no. I know the truth. I know who I am. I have peace with God. 
I have faith. You know what faith is? It's a God-given gift to have the ability to believe in him. The God-given ability to trust in his promise, to believe that when you share this word that is true, that it actually goes forth and does something. You believe it. You believe in his promises. You believe that what he says will come to pass. And it all comes from your salvation. When you said yes to Jesus, all these things are available to you. And then you have the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, which has all of what I just told you in it, so you can explain it to people. This is the word of truth. So you have the armor of God. Last but not least, you have your testimony. The Bible says in Revelation 12, 11, that we overcome or defeat the enemy by the blood of the lamb, what Jesus did on the cross, and the word of your testimony. In other words, we overcome the enemy by what Jesus did and then what it did to your life. And you tell people, listen, this is who I was, then I met Jesus, this is who I am. That's your testimony, and it's powerful. This is what God did. These are six weapons of the warrior. And they're all available to you, to use, to win. It's also worth noting here that in the text here in Joshua, it says, look back there for a second, it says, stay with them until the Lord gives them rest as well. Stay with them. Do you see? Endure. When the, when the commission, the great permission, the great commission said, go make disciples, that means you have to go to those people. And then it says to teach them to obey all that I've taught you, that means you stay with them. You don't just go to them to get them converted, but you actually stay with them. You're, you're giving them your time. A true warrior stands by that person they're trying to help. They attach to them. They come alongside. They give them time. They're committed to them. They're loyal to that person. That's what a real warrior is. That's part of becoming a culture-creating community here at the church. We're, we're introducing people into a new way of thinking, a new way of living, a new way of talking, a new way of, of forgiving and loving, a whole new way of life, and then getting them ready and preparing them by staying with them. Timothy, you need a Timothy. You need to be teaching people. The older ladies need to be teaching the younger ladies. The older guys need to be teaching the younger guys. Equipping them, getting them ready to be warriors, to send them back out to the battlefield to go do in another person what you just did in them. That's what we're supposed to be doing. <clears throat> we're on mission, and we're fully armed. Here's the last thing. They lead. Look back at verse 14. It says, your wives, children, and livestock may remain here in the land Moses assigned to you on the east side of the Jordan, but your strong warriors must go. You see, some people aren't on the front lines. And I get that. Some people are, are called to, I mean, think about the wives and the children and the livestock. I don't know the picture that comes to mind for you, but, <clears throat> you know, moms just take care of their family, man. My wife does a great job of it. She takes care of us. And while I'm out here doing my crazy Jesus stuff, she's at home taking care of our home, and she's taking care of my children, and she's taking care of me. Some people aren't always in the front lines. They're staying back in the camp. Jesus told Peter, hey, do you love me? Then feed my sheep. Right? Feed my sheep. Equip them to be warriors to go back out and fight. But in the meantime, I need you, some people need to stay back in the camp. And they need to be praying for, for the people there. And they need to be praying for the warriors that are out front. Some people are at home. They're back. They're not on the front lines. They're praying and they're giving. They're funding. Like not everybody is the warrior out front, right? Some people aren't wired that way. Some people aren't ready yet. But some people are funding the warriors. Do you know there's a, there's a family in Chicago? They don't come here. They don't attend here. They live in Chicago. And every month, faithfully, for like the last four years, a check comes in the mail to this church for 140 bucks. And they don't come here. And they don't watch this. Every single month, they give more than 90% of the people that attend here. They fund the warriors to go out and fight. They encourage the flock, the family of God, 
They're here teaching, they're feeding, they're preparing new warriors. Meanwhile, the warriors that are out front, they're charging darkness with the gospel. I love the Apostle Paul. I mentioned him a little bit ago. <clears throat> he was, a, he was a, just a bad dude, man. He was a warrior, man. This guy was whipped and beaten and jailed. He went hungry. He was shipwrecked. He got bit by a poisonous snake, man. This guy definitely, he could have just said, man, I just got to slow down, man. I'm feeling burnt out. Really? You're feeling burnt out? The Apostle Paul was whipped, beaten with wooden rods, thrown in jail, shipwrecked, snake bitten, hated, ultimately killed. He could have quit. Kind of justified, right? If anyone was. But he didn't ever slow down. He didn't ever quit. And we read his word as the example of what we'd like to be like. He says in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, he says, I'm compelled to preach. He had this thing in him, right? This angst that was inside of him that wouldn't, it wouldn't let him sleep at night. When he was whipped and beaten and put in prison, he wouldn't sleep at night. He started singing hymns. He started singing songs to Jesus, right? That's who he would be. Gets put in jail, he leads the people in jail to Christ. What are you going to do against this guy? He can't be stopped. He says, woe to me if I do not preach. <clears throat> he says in that chapter, he says, verse 23, I think it is, he says, even though I'm a free man, even though I'm a free man, even though I'm a free woman, even though I'm, I, I'm in the land of the free, the home of the brave, I'm free, I can do, I, listen, I don't have to, I don't have to, 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 to go serve Jesus today, do you? Nobody has to, do you? We're a free man. Even though I'm a free man, he says, so I have the choice to say yes or no, but he said, but I'm compelled. I can't help it. So I do everything, he goes on to say in verse 23, he says, I do everything to share the gospel and share in its blessings. Everything. See, he chose, he made the choice to endure, even when things were difficult. <clears throat> you guys know... Um, you guys know who John Wesley is? Some people in here know who John Wesley is. John Wesley, was, he, was, uh, he lived there in the 1700s over in London. <clears throat> and he, I, I don't think he planned it, but he started the Methodist denomination. I don't think he set out to, to say, hey, I'm going to start the Methodist denomination. But he had some biblical beliefs, and he had a style in which he presented it. And so what happened was people just started to listen to him and copy his methodology. And so he used to ride around on horseback you know back when he was doing it they didn't have cars like we have now and so they have to get around on a horse and it is believed <clears throat> talking about enduring right talking about enduring in ministry working hard even though it's difficult long hours painful unappreciated it is believed that John Wesley traveled on horse over 250,000 miles and preached over 40,000 sermons 40,000 sermons. When I get done on Sunday after doing this twice, I go in that lobby and I collapse. And, and I'm so tired. And I think I've done maybe 600. That's a lot. 40,000 sermons, 250,000 miles on a horse. How's your rear end feel after that? How are your legs feeling after that? <clears throat> Did he ever quit? <clears throat> Never. <clears throat> he kept preaching till he died. 87 years old. He's on his deathbed. What's the date? March 2nd, 1791. 87 years old. And he's with his closest friends. And he raises his, la with his last breath. He lay raises his little feeble arms as high as he can and says, Farewell, farewell. The best of all is... God is with us. That's, that's how he ended his life. Fighting forward still to this day. Still to this day. Never tiring. Never stopping. Always on mission. Our mission here at Revolution is to connect others with Jesus Christ. So they can experience and enjoy all that we have been given in Christ. 
It's a shift in priorities, a change of perspective. It's a new purpose in people's lives. And it's not that you don't count. I want to make sure you understand that's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying that you don't count and that your happiness and your fulfillment don't matter. They actually do matter. They, do, they matter big time, and they matter big time to God. So much so that he's gracious by informing us how to find this happiness and fulfillment and peace and rest. How cruel would it be if he never told you how to get it? Yeah. How hard would it be for me to stand up before you and convince you that God loves you and he cares about you if he never told you how to find rest and peace and purpose and fulfillment and happiness and all that? But he makes it clear, and I hope I've made it clear to you tonight the best that I could, that it's by helping others find it also. That's our job. This type of sacrificial life isn't a walk in the park. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be hard. It's going to be tiring. It's going to be messy. And people aren't going to thank you. <laughs> you want to sign up? <laughs> but that's what it is. But Paul's word rings in my head. And I hope it rings in your head forever. Endure. Endure. Never stop. That's why you've been called. A warrior endures another day, and he keeps fighting until ultimate victory is had. Otherwise, you deprive people of what you have. And more importantly, you deprive God from the glory that he deserves. A king's glory is a growing population, and it's not up to us to deprive him of that glory. Amen? All right, listen. I can sit there and shout at you all night long, and it's not going to matter if we don't practice what we preach. So, there's a lot of things that I share with you tonight that we could do. You know, work for the peace and prosperity of the city. I don't know what that looks like for you. I don't know what it looks like necessarily for me other than just going back to the Lord in prayer and asking Him, what more can I do for you, Lord? But I do know this. It says to pray for the welfare of the city, for its welfare will determine yours. So, I want to take a few moments, and I want to do that. Let's all be warriors right now, prayer warriors. And let's pray. Let's pray for the people in these cities that we're planted into. Can we do that? Will you join me in praying, please? Please. Join me in praying for these people. Lord, um, first of all, I feel very, very impressed to just repent of my own lethargy, Lord. You know, my yelling and screaming doesn't always equal my level of commitment. My level of commitment to you is, um, is far from adequate. I know that your love for me won't change if I work harder, but I know that there could be some more results if I gave you all of myself instead of holding back the way I often do. I also understand, Lord, that my delivery isn't always the most pleasant. But I, me, and I don't know any other way to put it, but I hope, Lord, that somehow by your spirit you will take the words of this man tonight and just plant them in the hearts of everybody here so they hear your voice hear your call on their life to be a good soldier of Christ to endure suffering to keep praying to keep working to keep fighting forward to keep advancing the gospel to keep advancing the kingdom of Christ in this place where you've planted us Lord, sitting in this room right now, there's only really two, well, there's three things that we could do to fight for our people, to fight for these people. One is to come and to listen, to have you grow our faith so we'll be more bold in our sharing, to be more bold in our giving, 
to be more bold in our going forward and speaking to people and sharing the good news with them. So we've come. and You've shared your word with us tonight, so that's one. We could give generously so we could be more aggressive in our campaign here at Revolution to advance the kingdom of God and to kick back darkness and shine light on it. And so we're going to do that in just a few moments, Lord. Lord, right now we want to use our third weapon that's available in this room and that's to pray and so Lord I, I just want I'm just going to be the mouthpiece here but I know that I'm not the only one I know our hearts are, are going to be echoing these things from all areas in this room the things that I'm saying so please receive our prayers Lord and act upon them Lord we lift up the people that live in Leesburg Grand Island Fruitland Park, Tavares, Eustis, Bassville Park, all these surrounding areas right here, Lord, where you planted us. Lord, we pray for them. We pray, Lord, that your spirit would invade their heart right now. Lord, we pray against all the massive drug abuse, the meth and the heroin and the cocaine traffic that's through this community, Lord. We pray that you would take that which people love and desire to do right now, that, Lord, it would change those that, that love that stuff, that are profiting from it, Lord, that it would become repulsive to them, Lord. That these people that, that once said yes to this stuff would no longer want it anymore. That you'd change the desires of their heart. That you'd break addictions. That you'd help them choose a better way. That you're, that you're especially those that say that, that, that they're Christians, Lord. That, that if they have the Spirit of God living in them, <coughs> Lord, let it swell up inside them now. And give them the power to say no. Your word is true. What you choose to obey becomes your master. So, Lord, help these people to make better choices. Better choices, Lord, that bring glory to you and blessing to them and their families. Lord, we pray for our schools here in this community. We pray, Lord, against the violence and the drug abuse and the guns that go into the school and people getting hurt. We pray for your protection over the young minds of the students that hear evolutionary garbage in the school, Lord, that just confuses their little minds. Lord, we pray that your spirit would fall upon these cities and bring peace and prosperity and welfare to these people. Lord, I pray for those that are homeless right now. There's in abundance, Lord. I pray that you would speak to them tonight, Lord, wherever they are, under the stars, Lord, on park benches, in tents, behind stores, behind dumpsters, Lord. Lord, if, anything, if nothing else, Lord, let them know that they're loved by you and that you have not forgotten them, that, you're, that they're still on your mind, that they're still on your heart, and that there's hope found in Jesus. Lord, we pray for all the churches in our community. Bible-believing, Jesus-loving churches. I pray specifically, Lord, for the fellowship, for the warehouse, for the Father's house, for the Good News Church. I pray for Midway Baptist Church. I pray for First Baptist of Leesburg. And all those godly men, Lord, that you've place as pastors there. I pray, Lord, that you would help them to be warriors for you in this 2019. That they would fight forward. That your kingdom would advance through their ministries. That you'd bring them warrior men and warrior women to come alongside of them to help them fight and to win. Lord, because when we win, you win. And when you win, your kingdom advances. And that's what we want to be about. Lord, we want to be warriors as we give. I don't want to say anything. I just want you all to ask the Lord how you should give.
just do what he says to do. And we'll just say this, if you're struggling financially, God has told you in his word how to get out, how to fix that. If you want to break the curse of poverty and lack in your life, he says to give generously, and when you do, he'll provide all that you need and more so you can share with others. So ask the Lord how you should give. And then Mike, if you would mind, please. And Mike over here, would you just come go through the room and just receive whatever gift someone wants to give to the Lord? Just give them a moment. whatever gift you have for the Lord, whatever you want to invest into other people so they can be in the kingdom as well, please do so. Just place it there. If you want to put it in the box on the back wall, you can do that too, whatever you want to do. I just want to encourage you guys. I want to see it in the land of the living, man. You know? I want to see it in the land of the living. Great churches across the world, influential churches, churches that have a big fingerprint, two things are happening. God is at work mightily there. And the people are fully engaged. Great churches don't happen when 20,000 people decide to blow off kingdom work. It happens when they decide to engage and fight forward. I want to see it in the land of the living. I'm in. I'm totally in. Hope that you're totally in. So we're gonna take a few moments now. We're gonna we're gonna praise him. Let me ask you guys a question. Show of hands. How many people felt like God spoke to them tonight personally? Raise your hand. You heard from them. Okay, awesome. Good, 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 good. So showed up, right? You ready to show up? All right, come on, let's get to our feet and let's worship this amazing, amazing God who is to be exalted.